Hi there, so this is the first part of a new video series that I am starting on chess openings and it's basically on public demand. Uh, most of my viewers on my stream at Twitch wanted to study chess openings and uh, you know the, this is, this is uh, something that a lot of aspiring players also want to do which is to study opening theory. So I decided to do this video series on chess openings for my channel on YouTube. Uh, even though personally I'm of the view that uh, developing your chess concepts, your conceptual skills uh, like middle game technique, end game technique, tactics, prophylaxis, position play and so on is more important as compared to learning opening theory. And you know eventually with the experience and, and simply by playing chess and, and developing your conceptual skills you you get to learn the opening lines but uh, you know it's understandable I guess that uh, one could say that you know you can speed up the process by studying opening lines so yeah because of all those reasons I am doing this video series and the first part of this video series is uh, on an opening called the scotch game so the scotch game uh, opening is something which we are going to be discussing today so i will be starting off uh, this first part with a customary quote and uh, that quote is how come the little things bother you when you are in a bad position they don't bother you in good positions yasir siravan there you go, Yasser Siravan, the American chess grandmaster, the Syrian-born American chess grandmaster, a four-time US chess champion as well. And what I think Yasser is trying to say, say over here is that we should try to live in the moment. We, we should try to live in the present. But as it is, more often than not, uh, we are constantly concerned with what has happened in the past what is going to happen in the future and, and uh, you know that is not only true on the chessboard but also in real life and, and that is another thing that is another reason why I love this game so much because you know chess is a game which reflects life it teaches us about life so yeah you know whenever we are in a good position in a game you know uh, we don't mind uh, the little mistakes that we make you know, like uh, we won't mind losing a few pawns or even a piece or even the queen when we know that we are going to uh, in the end checkmate our opponent. We don't mind that. But whenever we are in a bad position and we are in a losing position, uh, we constantly think about those little things that we could have done. You know, maybe I should not have gone for this pawn move and should gone with a developing move, try to develop faster, something like that. And we, you know, focus on all the little what ifs that make us feel all the more depressed depressed in that situation. So I think what Yasir is trying to say over here is that we should try and live in the moment, in the present, and try and make do in the best possible manner with whatever we have got. And and you know, I know it's easier said than done. Uh, it's very difficult to do that. But if we can try to have that same positive mindset that we have when we are in a, in a good position, in a winning position and try to replicate that mindset in a bad position, maybe we can start winning games that we are not supposed to win at all. So, you know, a very thought provoking, a deep quote by Yasir Sirivan and I just thought it would be nice to share it with you. So moving towards uh, the Scotch game. So I will start off with a brief introduction about the Scotch game, then we will discuss a little history about the Scotch game and then do the main variations in this chess opening. So according to the chesswebsite.com, the Scotch game has recently regained popularity as many top players such as Gary Kasparov and Jan Timmen have used it as a surprise against players who are well equipped to face the Rideau Pills. The Scotch is very similar to the center game where d4 opens up lines for development and also gives white early center control. 
The Scotch game black will be able to develop easy and white should look to take advantage of its spatial and center control. So as white, you enjoy a certain amount of space advantage and you have a certain amount of center control. And uh, then it's further written that uh, any chess player that likes to play e4 should study the scotch game as there are many subtle traps that black can fall into that will give white an overwhelming advantage. Most players expect white to play bishop b5 or the third move or bishop c4 uh, and then white instead transposes in the scotch game uh, with d4 on the third move. They sometimes will make amateur mistakes leaving the door open for white to take control of the game. So if you take a look at the analysis board over here and uh, yeah I'll just uh, flip this in uh, white's perspective and uh, after e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6 and what you usually come across over here is a move like bishop to b5 which is the reload this uh, variation and uh, you know if, if if not bishop e5 then bishop c4 which is the Italian game but instead if your opponent decides to go with d4 then this is this is an opening that uh, you don't usually come across uh, the scotch game but uh, it is played and uh, this is true not only at uh, an amateur level but also at the top level you know this is not played all that often so it's further written on the chesswebsite.com. It is also very important to study the scotch game as black and learn the different lines and find the line that fits your playing style the best. The scotch game is an opening that if you're not prepared, you can be in a lot of trouble early on. So know the key concepts of the opening. So first, let's see the first few moves that make up the scotch game and then we will also do its variations later. Uh, in fact, I've already done the first few moves of, of the scotch game. You know over here uh, basically e4 e5 knight f3 knight c6 and b4 so there you go these first few moves make up the scotch game and now we are going to discuss a little history about the scotch game and according to wikipedia domenico ercole del rio in his 1750 treatise on the game of chess practical observations by an anonymous modernist author was the first author to mention what is now called scotch game a treatise is like a longer version of the essay by the way uh, so domenico ercole del rio was an italian lawyer and author he composed many chess problems and was known as the devil who could not be beaten and uh, we are going to go through one of the chess problems composed by Ercole. It's a very interesting chess puzzle. So I am going to load that uh, puzzle, that chess problem for you on the analysis board right away. Copy the moves here. And there we go. So it's white to move and to draw. And if you take a look at uh, both sides material then basically uh, based on on uh, material value on pure material value both sides are equal like black has a queen and a pawn but uh, white has also got three minor pieces plus a pawn so according to a value of material both sides have 10 10 points worth of material but the black king is stuck over here in the corner on a8 and uh, in comparison white has these uh, three minor pieces although they are somewhat disconnected especially this knight on g6 which is far away from the rest of its pieces and if white is not careful over here then it might easily blunder a piece and lose the game so if you would like to find a correct move for white to draw then uh, you know i'll give you a few seconds And the move is knight to e7 and on first impression it looks as if white has blundered a piece because now the black queen can simply take this knight on e7 but wait white has bishop to d5 check the black king basically has got only two squares to go to and it doesn't matter which square the black king goes to like it goes to a7 over here it's going to fall to knight 
to c6 which is going to fork uh, black king and pick up uh, the queen so you know the black queen cannot take on e7 as such but instead it goes for d5 trying to make use of uh, this pin against this uh, white bishop which is pinned to the defense of the king and now knight to c6 by white basically breaking the pin but this also allows black to win the bishop the pawn takes on c4 but now white simply plays c3 and in this position it's a positional draw and the reason behind that is these two connected knights over here they are guarding these squares uh, and you know not allowing this black king to escape and uh, the black queen on its own is unable to mate the white king and uh, you know after after a few moves this pawn on c4 is eventually going to fall and all what the white king has to do is uh, move away from the checks of the black queen and and you know it's position draw so there you go very interesting puzzle by domenico ercole del rio the devil who could never be beaten and uh, then it's further written on wikipedia that uh, the scotch game opening received its name from a correspondence match in 1824 between edinburgh which is the capital of scotland and london now we are going to go through the main variations of the scotch game so i am going to load main variation sequence for you on the analysis board we do that should be fine e4 e5 knight f3 knight c6 b4 pawn takes on b4 by black knight takes on d4 and now bishop to c5 which is a classical variation of the scotch game and uh, you know white has a few moves over here possible including bishop e3 or simply moving the knight to b3 counter attacking this black bishop on c5 but uh, instead of uh, bishop to c5 black can also go with knight to f6 which is the schmidt variation and this now threatens to take the spawn on e4 and uh, once again white has a few moves possible including knight to c3 or another line that is played by white is uh, knight takes on c6 pawn takes on c6 e5 queen to e7 pinning this uh, pawn to the defense of the white king queen to e2 by white renewing the threat uh, on the black knight on f6 so now knight e5 c4 by white further attacking this knight but now bishop to a6, pinning this spot to the white queen. So, you know, this is a line that you can play in the Schmidt variation. And, uh, yeah. And another main line that is played in the Scotch game over here is queen to h4, which is the Steenitz variation. And this is an interesting move, queen to h4, and it's something that I, uh, you know, come across, uh, although a lot less frequently, uh, but uh, I never knew that this was actually a proper opening, uh, you know, and I, and I fi finally now know that this is actually, you know, a proper opening, which is seen its variation. So this black queen now threatens to take uh, the spawn on e4, and. Uh, one of the successful lines that is played uh, against the Steenitz variation as white is something that I am going to load on the analysis board for you right now. So, you know, this, this odd looking queen move, black bringing its queen into play very early. How to play against that as white? Uh, you know, it's going to go through that right now. E4, E5, Knight F3, Knight C6, D4, Pawn takes on D4, Knight takes on D4, Queen to H4, the scene is variation. Now Knight 
to c3 protecting this pawn on e4 but now bishop to b4 by black pinning this white knight to the defense of the king and this reduces the threat of queen takes on e4 and what white should go for over here is bishop to e2 allowing black to take the pawn and uh, you know as a result of that uh, even though it will go down upon white will get compensation in the form of a lead in development so after queen takes on e4 knight to b5 bishop takes on c3 pawn takes on c3 and even though white is now down a pawn it's got these doubled up pawns in the c file which is a weakness it has a lot of compensation because of this attacking knight on b5 this is now threatening to take on c7 and that is going to fork the black king and pick up the rook on a8 and uh, you know this there is no better move black has to play king to d8 if it goes to something like queen e5 then white can simply play f4 over here forcing the queen off the defense of this uh, you know c7 square so king uh sorry king to d8 over here and now the black king loses castling rights and now simply castling by white so you know white is down a pawn it's got doubled up pawns in the c file but it's got a lead in development the king is castled into safety it's got a bishop developed the knight is developed on b5 and in comparison black's king has lost castling rights and even though it's got the queen developed and the knight developed Black is going to have to waste a few moves further on into the game, trying to protect its king. And then, you know, while Black is doing that, White can uh, build an advantage, uh, you know, based on that. So you, there you go. That's a successful line that is played against the scene. It's variation. And then another variation, uh, main line variation. Uh, I will note that on analysis board. Queen to f6. So yeah, e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, d4, pawn takes on d4, knight takes on d4, and now queen to f6. So you know this this is now exerting pressure on this knight on d4, and white has number of moves possible over here. It can go with a move. Bishop to e3, supporting this knight, or uh, it can also, uh, you know, do something like knight to b3 over here. Although, you know, this move uh, is basically moving your uh, one of your developed pieces three times. The knight has moved from f3 to d4 and then to b3, and that is generally not advisable in early part of the game you know opening one of uh, moving one of your pieces so many times and then instead of queen f6 uh, another main line is knight takes on d4 and this is this is something which is a lot less common so after knight takes on d4 black can play knight takes on d4 and uh, you know after queen takes on d4 white now has uh, a little lead in development you know with a, Queen developed on d4 and a pawn in the center, uh, you know, and in comparison, black has uh, got no pieces developed. So, this is a move that is less frequently played. And another main line is bishop to b4. So, you know, over here, bishop to b4 check. So, you know, white can go uh, with a move like bishop to d2 or it can simply play c3 although this eliminates uh, you know this this uh, eliminates this c3 square temporarily and which is a natural you know square for a white queen side knight so there you go that's another main line and now a few gambits that can be played in the, the scotch game uh, of which the first is called the scotch gambit I'm going to load Scotch Gambit sequence on the analysis board for you. Copy the moves and uh, here we go. Alright, e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, 
d4 pawn takes on d4 and now bishop to c4 by white so this is the scotch gambit where white does not immediately take the pawn on d4 and a couple of lines that are played uh, from this position are uh, knight to f6 e5 b5 bishop to b5 knight to e4 knight takes on d4 so this is one of the lines and uh, another line is castling over here by white allowing the second pawn to fall knight takes on e4 but now white has rook f to e1 and after d5 a very interesting move bishop takes on d5 and uh, you know after queen takes the bishop on d5 another very interesting move knight to c3 and you know black cannot immediately take this knight if it takes with the pawn it simply loses its queen and since this knight is pinned on e4 to the defense of the black king it cannot take on c3 so you know uh, black can go for a move like queen to a5 and you know white gets back the piece that it had uh, you know, exchanged so there you go a couple of lines in the scotch gambit and alternatively uh, white can also play the goring gambit so going back over here um, instead of a bishop to c4 what white can play over here is c3 gambiting uh, you know uh, one pawn over here and after pawn takes on c3 white can play knight to c3 and the idea is basically developing your pieces faster white has got two knights developed it's got a pawn in the center and in comparison black is up a pawn but it's got only one piece developed so what white is trying to do over here is to go for initiative trying to develop its pieces really quickly so it can have more attacking chances and uh, you know over here white can also uh, play with a double pawn gambit by playing the move bishop to c4 and allowing black to take yet another pawn and uh, you know after bishop takes on c2 white has three minor pieces now developed for the two pawns that it has gambited so there you go that's another gambit uh, in the scotch game and the last gambit that I am going to show you is bishop to b5, which is the Relson gambit. So over here, after pawn takes on d4, what white can play is bishop to b5. And this is a less commonly played gambit, but uh, this is also something that you can go for. And this is called the Relson gambit attacking this black knight on c6 uh, which is currently defending this pawn although white can take this pawn you know without attacking the knight but uh, you know just trying to uh, you know add some pressure double up pawns over here on on, on, on the c6 for on, on on the c file for black so there you go the rest in gambit and uh, so yeah, those were the main variations of the scotch game along with the gambits and now we are going to go through a couple of games, famous games that were played, uh, you know, on this opening scotch game. So the first game I'm going to load on the analysis board was played in 2002 and that was played between Sergei Kajakin who is a super GM from Russia and uh, He's playing with the white pieces over here and uh, the black player is someone called Vasily Borisovich Malinin who is also a Russian Grandmaster. So let's get uh, into the moves of the game. E4, Knight C6, D4, C5, Knight F3, Pawn takes or D4. So basically the sequence of the moves has changed a bit but at the end of it, we end up in the scotch game. So knight takes on d4 and now queen to h4, which, which is the steenage variation, something that we went through in the early part of the video. And now knight to c3, bishop to b4, and bishop to e2. And this is also the line that we discussed, you know, in this video. 
And now instead of taking the pawn on e4, Malinin went for a developing move. Knight to f6. So castling by white, bishop takes on c3. And Kajakin played knight to f5 over here. Not immediately taking the bishop, but instead gaining a tempo. Uh, because this knight now attacks this uh, black queen on h4. The queen takes on e4 was played by Malanin and now bishop to d3 gaining a further tempo on the black queen and queen to g4 Malanin trying to exchange uh, you know uh, queens over here it's, he's up upon and uh, you know just trying to simplify the situation by exchanging but Kirjakin had none of it played f3 so queen to a4 and now Kirjakin finally took on c3 and castling by black I'm sure Malanin uttered a sigh of relief having finally castled and he thought he was out of the woods but a very interesting move a very deep sacrifice that Kajakin played over here was knight takes on g7 and the whole idea behind the sacrifice is to lower the black king out into the open. So after king takes on g7, a double sacrifice, bishop to h6, check. King takes on h6 and now queen to d3, check. Checking the black king. So king to h5, if uh, you know black goes for uh, king to g7 over here, white gets a really strong attack by playing queen to g6 and you know it will uh, get back one of the pieces that it has sacrificed along with a very strong attack so anyways uh, king to h5 over here and now g4 check so knight takes on g4 uh, you know malanin sacrificing giving back one of the uh, pieces that he had won in order to try and defend his king but it was all in vain the pawn takes on g4, queen takes on g4, check, king to h1, b6, trying to free up the movement for his light squared bishop, but now rook to f6, cutting off, uh, you know, this square on h6 for the black king. So, Kajakin tightening the noose uh, around his opponent. Queen to g5, but now bishop to e2, check, bishop to g4, blocking the check. Bishop takes on g4 check and Malanin resigned over here and it's it's pretty much losing over here regardless of whatever move that black uh, goes for. If king takes on g4, white has rook to g1 check and similarly if uh, queen takes on g4 then white has queen to h6 mate so it's pretty much over. Or black so there you go uh, a very uh, interesting game by a very strong player Sergey Kajakin and the second game I'm going to load on the analysis board was played in 1857 and that was played uh, by Paul Morphy one of my favorite players from the romantic era so Paul Morphy is playing with the white with the black pieces over here. So I'm going to flip this board, black's perspective. The white player is Theodore Lichtenheim, who was an American chess master. So let's get into the moves of the game. E4, E5, Knight F3, Knight C6, Bishop to C4, looking like an Italian game, but it transposes after Knight to F6 and D4. The pawn takes on d4 and we have the scotch gambit on hand. So e5 and this is another line that we went through in this video earlier. d5, bishop to b5, knight to e4, knight takes on d4, bishop to d7 by Morphy, knight takes on c6 and usually the move that is played by white in this position is bishop takes c6 but instead Theodore went with the knight takes on c6. The so pawn takes on c6, threatening the white bishop. Bishop to d3, attacking the strong black knight on e4. Bishop to c5 by Morphy. 
bishop takes on c4 and now queen to h4 with immediate threats of mate on f2 combined with this bishop not immediately taking the light squared white bishop so queen to uh, e2 defending against the mate pawn takes on e4 bishop to e3 adding yet another defender to the f2 pawn but now bishop to g4 attacking white's queen queen to c4 by theodore bishop takes on e3 now g3 by theodore the queen to d7 pawn takes on e3 but now black is winning after queen takes uh sorry queen to d1 check so a very lethal check you know to uh, that and this is you know really winning over here for uh, black and even though uh, white uh, might be able to win some material she's going to end up losing the game so king to f2 queen to f3 check king to g1 and now bishop to h3 and the major threat is queen to g2 which is going to be made so Theodore, uh, you know, took over here on c6, and although this does give a check to the black king, but it's all in vain. So king to f8 by Morphy, allowing the rook on a8 to fall. Queen takes on a8, and now king to e7. And, uh, you know, white has run out of checks over here. And, you know, over here, Theodore resigned, even though he can win the black other black rook on h8 but he simply gets made it afterwards by queen to g2 so there you go another very interesting game by a very uh, you know a, a great chess player paul morphy one of my favorites so there you go so over here i'm going to end this uh, part on the scotch game and uh, no, I hope that you enjoyed the video. If you did, then please do hit the like button. I'm very new to video making. Uh, I have a deep passion for chess. Uh, you know, I have a huge love for this game. And I would love to have some feedback from you, some comments, some suggestions. Uh, you know, if you have any, any suggestions on how I can improve my videos, I would love to hear them. And uh, yeah, so that's it for now. Uh, hope you enjoyed this video. Till next time. Take care.